Silent Hill 2 is the flagship game of the Silent Hill series. But is the story any better here than in Silent Hill 1? I've been expecting you. It was foretold by gyromancy. Shouldn't be hard to beat. Take a look at this intro scene. James looking into a mirror suggests reflection. Him reflecting on himself. In this intro shot, the camera pans down to a urinal. They didn't have to do this. They could have put the camera in the back corner. But they had to show the urinal. Why? There's some kind of phallic reference here. We'll see a lot of that. Brace yourselves. James just got a letter from his wife, who died three years ago? Maybe she's not dead. Maybe someone's playing a cruel joke. Maybe it's Gyromancy. Whatever, I guess there's no reason to believe the letter is fake. We've got our quest. Look for her dead or not so dead wife. This is quite a long run. Quite a different slower start than Silent Hill 1. Not that that's a bad thing. Maybe Silent Hill lends itself better to a slow burn kind of story. The first save point is near a well. Will that be important later? Maybe there's a water theme. We meet a woman looking at graves in a graveyard. Did she get a letter from a dead person too? It's unclear. She's looking for her mother though. She seems as confused as I am. We end up finding a radio just like in the last game. This time though we hear a person rather than just static. She sounds like Mary to me. We find something that looks like someone in a straight jacket. In the first Silent Hill game, monsters had a reason for looking the way they did. So here I wonder if Mary was ever in a straight jacket, or if someone was imprisoned by the other. Either James imprisoned Mary, or vice versa. Or both. A nice, happy family. There's corpses scattered about here, and I get the feeling that maybe these are people like James or the woman we just met. Maybe people are drawn to the town now. Maybe things in the town kill them. We're trying to get to Rosewater Park because it's mentioned in the letter, but the whole way seems blocked off. We find a series of breadcrumb notes telling us we need to go through the apartments to get there. Uh, okay. An apartment. Probably a place where James and Mary stayed at some point. If you find the six pack and drop it in this trash chute, you end up finding this note outside. Walter Sullivan seems like a real jerk. Also, I have no idea how to interpret this information right now. Is Walter the Alessa of Silent Hill 2? Are things manifesting through his nightmares? Somehow, I don't think so. But Walter does mention something called the Red Devil, which seems important. Look at how this mannequin with the flashlight is dressed. Does this look familiar? Yeah, those are Mary's clothes. So here's the famous Silent Hill guy. Red pyramid, pyramid thing, pyramid head. Look how much this scene resembles James looking in a mirror. Remember how the game started? In the writing world, we call that good storytelling. We later see the monster doing things to some of these mannequins as James watches from the closet. This may or may not be a callback to a scene from the David Lynch movie Blue Velvet, where Dennis Hopper's character does weird fetish stuff to Isabella Rosalini's character, while Dale Cooper watches from the closet. Here's a clip. Now what is that scene about? I'm not sure. It's a David Lynch film. What is any David Lynch film about? I don't think David Lynch could answer that. What are you talking about? But this pyramid head scene with these mannequins seems to be some kind of power abuse scene. Also these mannequins, look at them. They are two pairs of legs and two pairs of crotches. I don't think I have to do much interpreting here, but I will. They're about sex. Yeah. Moving on. Why are there butterflies here? I don't know. Then there's this part where a girl kooks a key away from you, but then she runs away instead of disappearing like Alessa from the first game. Remember this, it will be important much later. When we go through this fire escape, we enter the other world. Note that this other world does not look like the other world in Silent Hill 1. Things don't look burned here. Things look older and perhaps water damaged? Just a thought. If you go into this room, you hear this. And there's a dead body in the kitchen. Yeah, this is creepy. The first thing this guy who dresses like an eight-year-old says is, I didn't do it. And with that, we come to storytelling rule number one. Anytime someone denies something in a story, don't believe them. He tells James his name is Eddie. James asks him about the dead body in the kitchen, and Eddie says again, I didn't do it. Story rule number two. If someone denies something twice, we know they did it 100%. Later we meet Angela again, and this is such a cinematic pose here. Laying next to the mirror with the knife. Mirrors and reflections are a big deal in this game. When we get these dialogues, I pay really close attention. Story rule number three. Everything everyone talks about is very, very important. It may seem sometimes like there are filler conversations, but in a good story, everything is important. These lines are things we need to know if we want to make sense of this story. One of the first exchanges between James and Angela goes like this. Angela, okay. I don't know what you're planning, but there's always another way. 
Really? But you're the same as me. It's easier just to run. Besides, is what we deserve. Angela believes she deserves the blade of a knife. That's dark. It's also one of the first insights we get to her character. She feels as if she needs punishment or that she's guilty of something. Contrast this with Eddie who denies any wrongdoing. Angela's tone wavers here from trust to distrust. She ends up asking us to take the knife, then freaks out when we get close to her. Later we fight Pyramid Head. Notice that the place fills up with water. Remember the first save point in a well? When we get out of the apartments, we run into the little girl who kicked the key away from James. She knows Mary's name and accuses James of never loving Mary. Ouch. So that park that has been our destination this entire trip. When we get there, we see a cutscene. There's a woman who looks just like Mary. My name is Maria. I don't look like a uh, ghost, do I? So is she a ghost? Has James imagined this woman? I look like Mary, don't I? You loved her, right? Huh. Or maybe you hated her. This is pretty telling. Story rule number four. When a character tells another character how they feel, that's probably how they feel. Oh, disclaimer about these rules. There are no story rules, or every rule can be broken, however you want to interpret that. What are you talking about? We end up at a bowling alley. Maria won't go in. We see Eddie and the girl talking to each other. Seems like the cops were after Eddie for something, but we don't know what it is since he denies guilt of anything. We also hear Eddie say this to the girl. Did you find the lady you're looking for? What's her name? Mary? So she's looking for Mary as well. Now at this point I'm thinking, okay, what's real and what isn't here? I think Eddie and Laura are real. They were just talking to each other. Angela seems real as well. Monsters don't usually have complex trauma. But Maria and even Mary? I'm not sure. Maria not going into the bowling alley is a red flag. If she doesn't interact with anyone but James, that makes me suspicious. But what the hell is Maria? And what the hell happened to Mary? Can't leave out this scene. This town is full of monsters. How can you sit there and eat pizza? We end up going after Laura, who has a really bad habit of running away. Well, I guess I run away a lot too. Laura runs to a hospital. To get there, we have to go through a strip club? I do not know the point of the strip club beyond the fact that Maria has the key to the place. Did Maria work there? Did James fantasize about Mary's stripping? There's some kind of sexual significance to this. There's nurse enemies here, but no doctors. These nurses are curvier than the first Silent Hill nurses. Are these supposed to represent the nurses that took care of Mary? Why are they sexualized? I'm starting to think that maybe Mary's sickness left James sexually frustrated. Maria starts feeling bad, lays down and takes some pills. James looks for Laura. We end up on the roof before Pyramid Head shows up and knocks us off the roof. I have no idea why Pyramid Head knocks us off the roof rather than to advance the plot. We find Laura. She says she knew Mary from the hospital. This hospital? I'm starting to get Silent Hill 1 flashbacks. Laura says she met Mary last year, but I thought Mary died four years ago. Then there's this weird scene where Laura locks us in a room and we fight this thing. This frame seems like a bed and this mouth is emphasized, but I'm not sure what the significance is here. Is the mouth sexual? Is the mouth supposed to be a source of harm? Is this creature supposed to represent Mary in some way? I don't know. Yet. We wake up in the Otherworld Hospital. Again, this does not look like Alessa's Nightmare World. This is something else. If you go back to Maria's room, she's no longer there. You find her again in the basement, and she's very mean to James. Anyway! What do you mean, anyway? You don't sound very happy to see me. I was almost killed back there. Why didn't you try to save me? All you care about is that dead wife of yours. Remember what I said about the mouth of the creature causing harm? Hmm. Maria also says that even though she hasn't met Laura, she feels like it's up to her to protect her? At this point, I'm thinking Maria is some kind of ghost of Mary or something. Or there's a possibility that she's part of Mary in some way. We get on an elevator and get a very, very strange audio bit on the radio. I feel like this has to be a reference to something, but I don't know what. It doesn't seem to have story relevance, though. We end up being chased by Pyramid Head. He kills Maria, I think. Then there's this whole scene which is a microcosm of the story. James not being able to save Maria just like he couldn't save Mary. But what about Pyramid Head? 
Remember that scene where we met Pyramid Head and I said it was kind of like James looking in a mirror? Yeah. After a long series of ping pong quests, we end up at the Historical Society. There's some really good lore here if you spend all the time to inspect these pictures. Pyramid Head seems to be dressed like the 19th century executioners that worked in Silent Hill. There's a series of holes we drop down, which doesn't seem like the best idea, but I don't know if there's any good ideas here besides leaving. After one drop down, we end up in... a well? Remember that first save point from the start of the game? Yeah, there's something going on with water here. In a prison cafeteria, yes, there's a prison below the historical society, we meet Eddie again. Eddie is clearly lost in the pizza sauce here. He talks about murder. There's a dead guy near here. Things are not looking good for Eddie. After dropping down even more holes, we end up finding Maria? I thought she was dead. She doesn't remember being stabbed. Then she says, remember that time in the hotel? That and the earlier Laura comment make me think she has Mary's memory somehow. She says this. Don't you want to touch me? I don't know. Come and get me. I can't do anything through these bars. Oh, there's plenty of things you can do through those bars, Maria. James tries to find a way to Maria and we end up in a strange place outside of a room that has Angela in it. We find this document describing the murder of a man with a sharp-edged weapon. Video game story rule number one. Proximity is important. Proximity is a signpost for connection. In other words, this note is about who it's close to, Angela. We can guess that Angela murdered this guy with her knife because of his abuse. In this room with these things, we meet Angela and immediately fight this thing called Daddy. There's all these thrusting pistons on the wall. Remember when I said there was a lot of sexual symbolism here? I wish I was wrong in this room. How I wish I was wrong. After the fight, Angela accuses us of being after sex. Then she says more stuff that suggests that she was subjected to awful things. We finally get to Maria's prison cell and she's dead again? This scene makes me think that James is playing out in his mind how Mary died. We get to this part with three graves. If you check the names, it's James, Angela, and Eddie. We end up dropping down in a hole. The symbolism here is so thick you need a chainsaw to cut it. It's clear that James, Angela, and Eddie are all dealing with past trauma. They're all real people drawn to this strange town to deal with their violent pasts. The town seems to be doing different things to them. I think their worlds may look different to each of them. We have been seeing James' other world for the most part, but in that room where Angela was, I think that was Angela's other world. After we drop down in our own grave, we come to this freezer with an Eddie who has been driven over the edge. Eddie had a past of being bullied and snapped. He admits to killing and says he's going to kill James. We end up in a gunfight with him. This might be the first time we've killed a living person in Silent Hill 1 or 2. No, Sybil doesn't count. After fighting Eddie, we go through a door and end up on... The lake? I guess, I mean, how do you get out of that? Climb a ladder? We go on a long boat ride to reach a hotel. There's symbolism here. In Greek mythology, the river Styx separated the living from the dead. But in Greek mythology, there was a ferryman. And here, James serves as his own ferryman, which suggests that he is taking control of his fate. James finds a videotape early in the hotel. Then we meet Laura in the restaurant. She gives James a letter that Mary wrote for her. Mary says that she was going to adopt Laura if things had turned out differently. I think a major source of confusion in this game is that Laura says to James that she just turned 8 last week. But Mary wrote this letter, and James says that Mary died 3 years ago. Something's not adding up. We'll come back to this timeline later. Anyway, Laura mentions another letter by Mary and then runs off. Later we go up to the room that Mary and James stayed in and pop in the videotape. It shows Mary sick in bed, James by her side, then James snuffing her out with a pillow. James spends a long time in this pose. Remember that body we found in the apartments? Does it look familiar? Enter Laura's stage left. James admits he killed Mary to Laura, which I don't think is the right move. But then again, James has some serious issues. After Laura leaves, we hear Mary or Maria's voice on the radio. If you go to this room, you can hear some dialogue between James and a doctor talking about Mary not having a long time to live. Before we get to the end of the game, I want to talk about the time discrepancy between what James says, Mary died three years ago, and Laura's eighth birthday being last week. I think we have to say that Laura is the one telling the truth here. Her eighth birthday was last week. So if that's true, and Mary did write the letter to Laura for her eighth birthday, then Mary wrote the letter last week. Was it Mary's ghost that wrote the letter? No, I don't think we need that. A living, breathing Mary wrote that letter. Well, you might say, if Mary did die last week though, why does James say Mary died three years ago? 
Well, remember what the doctor said about Mary having three years to six months to live? I think what's going on here is that the Mary that James knew died at the start of her sickness. The Mary James knew was gone then. Mary must have lived three years before James could not take any more and murdered her. Mary very likely died last week. James is just delusional about when she died. In the basement of the hotel, we meet Angela, and just like last time, I think we're seeing her other world here. She believes James to be her mother. We get this really interesting quote at the end before Angela walks off, seemingly to her death. It's hot as hell in here. You see it too. For me, it's always like this. This suggests to me that Angela's whole Silent Hill experience is fire-themed, whereas James is water-themed. So I wonder if Eddie had a theme since the three of them are all connected in this narrative. Remember those graves? The only elemental thing I can think of for Eddie is coldness, but I really don't know how much evidence there is for that. He wears shorts all the time anyway. I like to think he just saw pizza everywhere. How can you sit there and eat pizza? James also says, me? No, I'd never kill myself. But James has lied to himself about almost everything. Is this another instance of that? Spoiler alert, probably. So now it seems that all the plot threads have come to their end. Eddie, bullied to the point of lashing out, seems to have killed several people before coming to Silent Hill, where the town drove him to pure madness, and he killed more people. Finally, he lashed out at James, and James played the role of executioner, ending Eddie's story. Angela's past is filled with abusive men. This is why she's so distrustful of James. She took revenge on her father with a knife she carries constantly. The murder of her father did not bring her story to a close. Her trauma lasted until eventually she came to Silent Hill, where the town showed her a world of flames, and eventually led her to what we can only think is a fiery death. If you check out these portraits, they look like male bodies, castrated, which has to represent the family members who abused her. Yeah, heavy stuff. James doesn't really play executioner here for her, but he certainly could have done more to save her. James allowing her to die hurts. Compare how James treated Mary with how James treated Angela. It's a fun exercise. So now there's just one plot line to resolve, and that's James. We end up in a room with two pyramid heads and Maria hanging upside down in a rusted bed frame. They end up killing her. How many times has Maria died now? If there was any doubt that Maria is a creation of the town, that ends with this piece of dialogue from James. I was weak. That's why I needed you. I needed someone to punish me for my sins. But that's all over now. I know the truth. Now it's time to end this. This fight feels like James taking back control of his own psyche. It's James coming to accept what he did to Mary. After you beat the two pyramid heads, they commit seppuku, which does not seem like a good sign for James. You go down a long hallway and hear a dialogue between a sick Mary and James before James killed her. Notice how Mary lashes out at James and is verbally abusive towards him. Remember how in the hospital we fought the thing in the room with the prominent mouth that was trapped in a bed? Remember those things that Maria said to us? I think those are both manifestations of Mary and the verbal abuse that she subjected James to. We go outside and up on a roof. We talk to someone dressed like Mary. It's not Mary though, it's Maria. The dialogue changes depending on which ending you get. There's three major endings here. I'm not counting the joke ending, sorry. In the ending I got, James tells Maria that the gig is up. Then he fights her and we get a cutscene of James talking to a dying Mary. Now I think Mary is already dead here and James is talking to the spirit of Mary. James tells Mary that he hated her, that he wanted his life back. Mary asks James to live for her. Mary reads a final letter, then we see James leaving Silent Hill along with Laura. In another ending, things are pretty much the same, except that during the convo James has with Mary after the boss fight, Mary dies and then James takes her body out to a car and he drives that car into the water. Yeah, that's dark. The other ending involved James running away with a version of Maria directly after the boss fight, which suggests that there's many different Marias. I guess. What are you talking about? So which ending is canon? According to the stuff I read online, there isn't one. It's left up to the player, which is cool. I'm torn on which ending I like here. I do like James living and running away with Laura. 
In that ending, James has learned something from seeing what happened to Eddie and Angela. But in the ending where James commits seppuku by driving into the water works well as well. There's kind of an inevitable feeling that that's what's going to happen the whole game, and it really fits with James' water-damaged otherworld. In all three endings, Mary reads a letter that she wrote to James. It's really touching. There's one phrase I want to pay attention to because it explains something way long ago that I said I'd come back to. And so I wait, wrapped in my cocoon of pain and loneliness. Remember those butterflies in the apartments? Or how about this attack that Maria does when we fight her? Yeah, the story's pretty good. We have a clear protagonist, he has a clear goal. We twist and turn our way to a resolution. The story is just clear enough so that the player can make it out. And even if someone isn't paying close attention to the story, they will still have that aha moment at the end and go, Oh, James killed his wife. That's what's going on. There's a remake of this game coming later this year. I don't know how I feel about it. Remakes sometimes become about the game being remade rather than the story that the first game tells. All I'll say is, good luck, Bloober team. Don't mess it up. As for this original game, I think the devs did a good job by not continuing the story that was in the first game. I mean, how would you continue that anyway? Who the hell even was that baby that Harry ran off with? How could you go back to that whole pulpy cult thing? Oh. Oh no. I've been expecting you. It was foretold by gyromancy. 